All right, guys. So welcome to another week. Um, we are in week 10. So today is October 18th, and we have the whole week to get through chapter 12, which is on the heart. Um, so we'll probably get through about half of the PowerPoint today and about half the PowerPoint on Wednesday. And then in lab this week, um, you guys will be looking at a sheep eye dissection. Um, so just normal lab. Um, for those of you who just joined us or who are listening to the recording, um, I don't have access to my email or Canvas, so the IT department is working on getting um, kind of me back online. So, you know, for today, for today's lab activity, um, this lab activity nine, I probably won't be able to enter in your grades right away today, but I'm hoping by the end of the week I can do that. Um, so if you do need to get in contact with me, though, you can email me. It's the same email address, E. Bamer, so my first initial and my last name, but it's at LBCC. Uh, dot edu that's long beach city college where i also teach so if you guys do need to get um, in contact with, with me just email me at that email because i don't have access to email or canvas right now which is not good um, and kim i saw that you're in here i have written down your lecture three exam score um, but i just haven't been able to enter it in so with that uh, we'll get started with the heart and I'll show you what this PowerPoint looks like. Again, you guys can find these PowerPoints in Canvas. It's about 65 slides. So we're going to get through about 30 slides today. Um, we'll take our time um, getting through it. And we'll get through the other 30 on Wednesday. So we won't rush through this one. So we're starting our cardiovascular talk. And we start this. We talked about blood. And now we'll start with our cardiovascular system by just focusing on the heart. So the heart itself is kind of the center of the cardiovascular system. It's a muscular pump that's essential for life because it pumps blood throughout the body. And getting blood to the different tissues of the body is important because blood is carrying oxygen, which is all of your which is what all of your tissues need. So the heart is the member of this system, um, but also as a part of this system, we have blood vessels, which are arteries and veins and the blood. For a healthy adult at rest, your heart pumps about five liters of blood per minute. And for most people, the heart continues to pump at approximately that same rate for more than 75 years. So here's a look at the cardiovascular system. You kind of see the heart at the center. Um, the heart is kind of like a two-sided pump that works um, in uh, exact rhythm with the both sides. And you can see here the major blood vessels coming out of the heart um, that we'll talk about. But again, the heart pumps blood away from the heart in all of the red blood vessels. So the red blood vessels signify um, arteries that contain oxygen and the blue blood vessels signify veins that do not contain oxygen that are bringing blood back to the heart. So the heart itself, um, it's a member of the system, a little bit of repeating here. Uh, it's two pumps in one with the heart's right side pumping blood to the lungs. So the right side of the heart pumps blood to the lungs where it will pick up oxygen. And then the left side of the heart um, pumps blood through the vessels. This is what we call pulmonary circulation when the heart pumps blood to the lungs and it comes back. Anything, anytime you see the word pulmonary, that means that has something to do with lungs. So pulmonary circulation is just the heart pumping blood to the lungs to pick up oxygen and then to return back to the heart with oxygenated blood. The left side of the heart pumps blood to all of the other tissues of the body and back to the right side of the heart. And we call this systemic circulation. So when your heart pumps oxygenated blood to all of your body's systems that are not the lungs, we call that systemic circulation, and that is what the left side of the heart does. So here's a look um, at the cardiovascular system and the two kind of circuits. So the pulmonary circulation, we'll talk about this one first. You can see here um, on the right side of the heart, and again, as we're looking at the heart, uh, we always label the right side of the heart where my laser is, how it would be on a person. So this is this person's uh, right side of their heart. And in red, this is the person's left side of their heart. So from here on out, we're going to label this where my cursor is the right side. And in red, this is the left side of the heart. 
So on the right side of the heart, I'm just letting someone else in. All right. So on the right side of the heart, um, from here, we can see it's blue. So that means it's deoxygenated blood. So the right side of the heart um, kind of acts as a reservoir to take in all the deoxygenated blood from all of the body's tissues. Then that deoxygenated blood, the right side of the heart will pump it to the lungs. So you can see how the, the blood leaves in these arrows and it goes to the lungs. And in the lungs, you can see how carbon dioxide is offloaded into the lungs. And that's what we breathe out when we exhale carbon dioxide. And you can see oxygen is then um, onloaded to these arteries. So then these red arteries or these red veins, because they're carrying oxygenated blood back to the heart, will travel into the left side of the heart. So this is pulmonary circulation when we have deoxygenated blood being pumped to the lungs to pick up oxygen, and then that oxygenated blood enters into the left side of the heart. The left side of the heart then will pump that blood to the rest of the body's system. So we have circulation to the tissues of the head where it'll offload oxygen and pick up carbon dioxide, which is a waste product of cells. And we have circulation to tissues of the lower body. So if we have blood going to the lungs, that's pulmonary circulation to pick up oxygen. And if we have blood going to the other parts of the body to offload that oxygen, that's called systemic circulation. The functions of the heart, it generates blood pressure. So your heart um, can control heart rate, heart rhythm, um, the amount of blood that is um, ejected from the heart to help generate a blood pressure. It also routes the blood. The heart has four chambers and blood goes very nicely through those four chambers. So it helps to route that blood. It always ensures one-way blood flow. So the heart kind of controls the one-way blood flow throughout the body because within the heart, there are valves that open and close so that blood only goes one way, which is very important. If blood does not flow one way, we run into problems, which we'll talk to, we'll talk about. It also regulates blood supply um, because of it can control how much blood it ejects at a certain time. So here's a little bit about heart anatomy and statistics. It's about the size of your fist. It weighs less than a pound. It's located between your lungs in the thoracic cavity. And the orientation of the heart is that it has kind of an apex, a pointed part um, that kind of points down and away um, from the rest of it. And the heart kind of lies a little bit to the left. So it's a little bit off center. Um, and that's why we'll see when we get to your respiratory system, your left lung is actually a little bit smaller than your right lung because the left lung gives more of a space for your heart to sit in. So that's the heart. And you can kind of see in this picture below where it lies within the rib cage. And again, just slightly um, to the left of the sternum. And again, when I say left, it's to that person's left. It has a pericardium, which is a double layered sac that anchors and protects the heart. The parietal pericardium is the membrane around the heart's cavity. So your heart lies in its own cavity and the parietal pericardium is the membrane that lines the heart's cavity and the visceral pericardium is actually the membrane that is exactly on the surface of the heart. And then you have a pericardial cavity, which is a space around the heart itself. And you can kind of see this here. So the pericardium is the, we have a fibrous and a serous pericardium. The serous pericardium layers you can see labeled here, the parietal pericardium where my cursor is, is just lining the cavity that the heart sits in. And the visceral pericardium is lining the viscera or the organ itself. And the little tiny space between the two is called the pericardial cavity. And that's filled with pericardial fluid um, just to kind of help as another shock absorber uh, around the heart. We have some external anatomy of the heart. Uh, the coronary sulcus extends around the heart, separating the atria from the ventricles. And there's four chambers to the heart. The atria are on the top, you have two of them, and the ventricles are on the bottom. And between the atria and ventricles, we have this, what we call a coronary sulcus. There are two grooves or sulci, which indicate the division between the right and left ventricles 
and they extend inferiorly from the coronary sulcus. And I'll show you a picture about this in a second. The anterior intervent interventricular sulcus extends inferiorly from the coronary sulcus on the anterior surface. There's a posterior interventricular sulcus. Interventricular means um, between ventricles. You have a superior and, inferior, and an inferior vena cava, which carry blood from the body to the right atrium. And you have four pulmonary veins, which drain the blood from the lungs to the left atrium. And you have two arteries, often called the great vessels or the great arteries that carry blood away from the ventricles of the heart. These two great vessels are the pulmonary trunk and the aorta. The pulmonary trunk comes from the right ventricle it splits into right and left pulmonary arteries, which carry blood to the lungs. And the aorta arises from the left ventricle and it carries blood to the rest of the body. So let's finally look at a picture so you're not just reading words on a screen. So here we have the surface anatomy of the heart and um, I'm gonna put on my laser. So again, we have four chambers to the heart. The atria are the chambers on the top and the ventricles are the chambers on the bottom. So here's the right atrium. And the right atrium is what kind of takes in blood from the rest of the body. So we have the superior vena cava draining deoxygenated blood from the head and neck into the right atrium. And the inferior vena cava drains blood from the bottom half of the body into the right atrium as well. From there, we have the right ventricle, which is the chamber below the right atrium. The left atrium, um, the heart is kind of... Uh, turned a little bit so that the left atrium, you can't see as much. It kind of makes up the back side of the heart. And then below the left atrium is the left ventricle. Out, come, out from the right ventricle, um, one of the great vessels is called the pulmonary trunk. And it's in blue. It, it will split into pulmonary arteries. And you can see those pulmonary arteries in blue where the pulmonary trunk has split. These arteries carry blood away from the heart to the lungs, but we show it in blue because it's deoxygenated blood. Once that blood has picked up oxygen from the lungs, it returns to the heart with oxygen into the left atrium, and it enters the left atrium via these left and right pulmonary veins. And again, these veins are um, red because they're carrying oxygen to the heart, but they're still considered veins because they're carrying blood to the heart. That oxygenated blood then enters into the left atrium. It goes into the left ventricle and then blood is pumped out through the aorta. And you can see the aorta here, it's this red big blood vessel. There's an aortic arch where you have different arteries coming off of it. And then the descending aorta, you don't see it, but it goes behind um, the heart and it travels down to kind of the rest of the body. So those are some kind of surface anatomy of the heart. I know this is a lot to take in. You see some right coronary arteries, um, great cardiac veins, anterior interventricular arteries. So what these are showing is your heart itself needs oxygen to function for the muscle tissues to contract in that cardiac muscle tissue. So we have blood supply going to the heart and we have blood being drained from the heart in the veins. If, for example, you have a blockage in this vein right here, which is a common place where people have blockages, and that blockage can be from built up of cholesterol or plaque, kind of fatty plaque that builds up in your arteries. If you have a blockage in one of these arteries, that means blood cannot bring oxygen to that part of the heart tissue. That part of the heart tissue, for example, let's say it's here, that part of the heart tissue will die and that causes a heart attack or a myocardial infarct. So let's look at the posterior side of the heart. I'm gonna kind of go through the same thing. So here we have we start in the right atrium because the right atrium takes in all the deoxygenated blood um, draining from the superior vena cava, which drains from the head, the neck, and also the upper limbs. And the inferior vena cava drains all the blood from the lower half of the body. The mitral valve, I'll, we'll talk about valves and where they're located too. 
So from the backside, you see the aorta, the pulmonary arteries, the pulmonary veins. This is a good look at the left atrium and how the left atrium kind of makes up the backside of the heart. And we see here the left ventricle, the right ventricle, as well as a large, what we call a coronary sinus, which is just where all the blood drains from the veins um, on the backside of the heart. The coronary sinus will drain directly into the right atrium as well. All right, so now we'll get into the heart chambers. So here are the four chambers, the left atrium, the right atrium, the left ventricle and the right ventricle. The atrium are on the top, the ventricles are on the bottom. The coronary sulcus separates the atria from the ventricle, so it goes kind of right in the middle of the heart. The atria themselves are the superior upper chambers. They are the holding chambers because they will hold the blood before the blood um, gets pushed into the ventricles below them. They're much smaller, they're thin walled because they don't have to push the blood that far. The blood just has to go from the atria to the ventricle. So the atria don't have um, thick muscular walls. They contract very minimally to push the blood into the ventricles because again, the blood doesn't have to go that far. And we have a septum. Whenever you see the word septum, that means a wall. And this interatrial septum separates the right from the left atria. The ventricles then are the inferior chambers. These are the pumping chambers. So they're much more thick, strong walled. This is where your muscular tissue will be because the ventricles have to contract forcefully to propel the blood out of the heart to either make it its way to the lungs or make it to the rest of the body. So the ventricles are extremely strong, thick walled uh, pumping chambers. We have an interventricular septum, which separates the right and left ventricles. And this again is a wall that goes right between the right and left ventricles. Now we'll talk about heart valves. So the heart valves are important because they open and close to allow blood to flow between the chambers as well as between um, the ventricles and whatever pumping vessel they're pumping out of. And these valves are extremely important for making sure that blood only flows in one direction. So we have atrioventricular valves and we often abbreviate them AV valves. We have two atrioventricular valves and these are the valves between the atria and the ventricles. So these will open and close to allow blood to go from the atria and then into the ventricles. The tricuspid valve is on the right side between the right atria and right ventricle. It's called tricuspid because it has three cusps. So it kind of makes little triangles that will open and close to allow blood to flow into that right ventricle. And the bicuspid, also known as your mitral valve. So this one gets a special name because it's extra important. And some people with problems in the mitral valve um, can lead to other issues. So the bicuspid valve just has two cusps and we also call that the mitral valve and it's located between the left atrium and left ventricle. And eventually we'll show you a picture of the inside of the heart and we'll talk a little more about these valves. So how do we control when these valves open? Um, each ventricle contains kind of these cone shaped muscular pillars called papillary muscles and they are attached by strong connective tissue strings called chordae tendinae to the free margins of the cusps of the atrioventricular valves. And when your ventricles contract to push out blood, the papillary muscles also contract and prevent the valves from opening into the atria by pulling on those chordae tendinae attached to the valve cusps. And I'll show you a picture of what I mean. The two other valves that are associated with the heart are called the semilunar valves. And these have kind of three half moon shaped cusps. And these are the valves between the pulmonary trunk and the aorta. So we have a pulmonary valve, which is the opening between the right ventricle and the pulmonary trunk and the aortic valve, which is at the opening to the aorta. So let's look at these valves together. So here where my laser is, here's our tricuspid valve. So this, I almost like the internal anatomy picture of the heart better because you could kind of see the chambers a little bit better. So here's the right atrium, the right ventricle. So again, the superior and inferior vena cava 
as well as the coronary sinus, which drains blood from the heart, they all um, bring deoxygenated blood into the right atria. Blood then flows into the right ventricle. Blood then flows out of the pulmonary trunk through the pulmonary arteries to the lungs to get oxygen. Blood enters back into the heart with oxygen into the left atria, down into the left ventricle, and then that oxygenated blood get pumps out through the aorta, aortic arch to all parts of the body. So how do we control this blood flow? Let's start with our first atrioventricular valve. This is the valve between an atria and a ventricle. And on the right side, it's called the tricuspid valve. You can see these little cone-shaped muscles. These are the papillary muscles, and they are attached to little pieces of connective tissue string called the chordae tendinae. And what happens is, is when your right ventricle contracts and pushes blood out of the pulmonary trunk, that contraction keeps these tight so that the tricuspid valve does not open back into the atria. So it keeps it nice and closed so that when your right ventricle contracts and blood shoots out of the pulmonary trunk to go to the lungs to get oxygen, blood isn't traveling back into the atria. You never want blood to go back into a chamber that it came from. And sometimes we can have leaky valves that don't close all the way. And that can be bad because if we ever get blood flowing back into a chamber that it just came from, it just messes up with the ability to control the um, kind of the strength of our contraction and the ejection of that blood. And I'll talk more about that when we get to the mitral valve too. So in order for blood to get ejected to the lungs through the pulmonary trunk, one of our semilunar valves has to open. And this is our first um, pulmonary semilunar valve and it's located at the opening to the pulmonary trunk and it's at in your right ventricle and your pulmonary semilunar valve will open to allow blood to flow through the pulmonary trunk. Our other atrioventricular valve is our bicuspid or mitral valve. Again, it has two cusps to it. Again, it will open when blood gets pushed from your left atrium to the left ventricle, and it will completely close off when blood gets ejected and forcefully contracted and pushed or propelled out of the aorta. When blood leaves the heart from the left ventricle, the aortic semilunar valve needs to open so that blood can leave and go out the aorta. You can see here how the left ventricle has the thickest walls of cardiac muscle. Why is the left ventricle the chamber with the thickest walls of cardiac muscle? Why do you guys think, if anyone's listening, they can put it in the chat if they want. So my question is, why do you think the left ventricle is the chamber with the thickest walls of cardiac muscle? And then talking a little bit more about the mitral valve, um, we can have mitral valve prolapse where it kind of goes back into the left atrium. So especially on the left side of the heart, if blood flows back into the left atrium and the left ventricle or the bicuspid valve doesn't have a totally tight seal, when your left ventricle contracts and it's the contracting um, ventricle or the contracting chamber that your body needs to get blood to all parts. So this is where your oxygenated blood is leaving to go up to the head, the neck, the arms, the lower half of the body. If we don't have a tight seal with the bicuspid valve, when that blood contracts, less blood and oxygen gets to your body tissues and it goes and it leaks back into the left atrium. So it totally messes up the pressure buildup that is needed for proper contraction and ejection of the blood with oxygen that all of your body's tissue needs. Some people can have a leaky valve. Or, uh, I had a student once who just said she had a leaky valve and it doesn't really bother her, but she just needs to keep track of it. Um, so some people can live with a leaky valve. It's really slight, but otherwise you might need some surgical um, help. Yeah, so the left ventricle has the thickest walls because it needs the most power to contract and push out that blood. If you think about it, the right ventricle needs thick muscular walls too, but it just needs to pump blood to your lungs. The left ventricle, that is what needs to pump blood uh, to all parts of the body. So that contraction and ejection of blood is a lot more powerful 
from the left ventricle than from the right. Good job. And your dog, Grecia, has mitral valve degeneration. Okay, oh, that's sad. And yes, to keep the blood pressure high, we cannot have blood leaking back. And Cameron, you have a mechanical heart valve in your pulmonary valve. Cameron, were you the one who said that you had heart surgery at the beginning of the course? I can't remember. I think you had several surgeries. And I think I said that you would have a chance to share your story if you want to, but you don't have to. But you do. So you have a mechanical heart valve in your pulmonary valve. So you're, Cameron, you have a mechanical. So I'm assuming you had surgery to put in some mechanical valve and that mechanical valve is right here so this valve is allowing you know the blood to go from the right ventricle to your lungs and you've had five open heart surgeries wow that's very interesting if you want to share more or talk about it feel free to as we're talking about this you probably know all about the heart already okay so this kind of gives you some internal anatomy of the heart the important thing uh the most important thing to remember or get out of today's class. And again, we're not gonna get through the, the whole lecture, but is to kind of review for yourself the flow of blood through the heart. Right atrium, how does, heart, how does blood get, get to the right atrium, into the right ventricle, through the pulmonary trunk to the lungs, into the left atrium, oxygenated, into the left ventricle and out through the aorta. So reviewing that would be helpful too. Wow, in bovine tissue. Interesting, Cameron. Thanks so much for sharing. All right, so here's a look at the heart valves in a cadaver heart. And again, it's always fun to see this on a real picture and not a drawing. Um, here's a look at the right ventricle with a tricuspid valve. And you can see a little bit of these cone-shaped papillary muscles. You can see these nice white chordae tenae and left ventricle how they're attached to that bicuspid valve. Here's a look at a superior view of these valves. So we've kind of cut through um, between atria and ventricles. So you can see the tricuspid valve, the bicuspid valve. So this is the right and left side. And you can also see the aortic semilunar valve going into the aorta with the pulmonary semilunar valve uh, going into the pulmonary trunk. So again, this shows you the flow of blood and how these heart valves will open and close uh, to allow blood flow. So for example, um, the aortic semilunar valve is closed and it's closed when the bicuspid valve is open. So this means that when the bicuspid valve is open, blood flows from the left atria to the left ventricle. Then the bicuspid valve closes for about a millisecond as we build up enough pressure in your left ventricle. Then the aortic semilunar valve um, kind of opens up as these papillary muscles contract to make sure your bicuspid valve stays nice and tight and closed so that when the left ventricle contracts, blood is going out of the aorta to your body's tissues who need the oxygen and not back into the atria. The closing of these valves makes a very um, audible sound. It makes the lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, lub dub sound that doctors listen for in the stethoscope. The lub sound, the first heart sound, the lub, is the closing of the atrioventricular valves. And the dub sound, the second um, heart sound, is the closing of the semilunar valves. So the lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, each lub dub is one kind of heart cycle and contraction unit of the heart. That's why the doctor listens for your heart sounds um, usually the first thing he does because you know it's just like the knee jerk reflex taking the hammer and banging it against your knee it's a simple measure that the doctor can use to test your nervous system listening to your heart sounds is an extremely important because doctors can hear for a heart murmur and a heart murmur means that they hear an extra whooshing heart sound so instead of hearing a lub dub lub dub lub dub they might hear a lub whoosh, lub whoosh, or they might hear like a third or a fourth heart sound. And when doctors hear those extra heart sounds, um, that is a heart murmur. That usually means what they're hearing, they're hearing blood whooshing back into an atria where it shouldn't happen, shouldn't go. 
So they are hearing usually one of the atrioventricular valves not closing all the way. And that whooshing noise they hear is heart flowing back into an atria that should not be happening. So the stethoscope, listening to heart sounds is a very important measure. Um, okay, we're gonna get through a couple more. I think I'm gonna get through about five more slides and then we'll do the rest on Wednesday. Um, so the cardiac skeleton um, is the plate of connective tissue. It's a fibrous skeleton. So it's a skeleton not made of bones, but of fibers that is fibrous rings that surround your atrioventricular and semilunar valves and give them a lot of solid support because really your body depends on the ability of these valves to open and close when they should and to make a very tight um, kind of so that no blood goes back in the opposite direction. This connective tissue plate also serves as electrical insulation between the atria and the ventricles and provides a rigid attachment site for cardiac muscle. And we'll talk about how your heart beats and the electrical activity that travels through the heart, but this cardiac skeleton helps with that too. So a heart murmur um, usually means that one of the valves is not closing properly. Some people can live with very slight heart murmurs, but it could get to the point where you need to have a mechanical heart valve implanted like Cameron, um, but a heart, it doesn't usually indicate a certain disease. Some people are just born with heart murmurs. Um, I'm not sure if it's genetic, or Cameron, if you know, you know, did it run in your family? I think, I think it's completely random. So I don't think um, in terms of disease, I, I don't know if heart murmurs are really associated with disease. Heart attacks are usually associated with some sort of blockage of an artery killing off tissue, but a heart murmur itself, I don't think is associated with a certain disease. I'm, sorry, I'm sure diseases could cause anything, but um, uh, many times people are just born with a slight a heart murmur. Good question. Okay, so yours was congenital, Cameron. Okay. Thanks for sharing, Cameron. I feel like I met like this cardiovascular specialist in our class. So this is great. If you guys have any questions, you should just ask him. So here's the cardiac skeleton. Again, it's kind of this fibrous network. Again, it's a fibrous or a fiber skeleton, not a bony skeleton. And this fibrous network um, is very um, kind of specifically arranged around the heart valves to provide support to the heart valves, as well as electrically insulate your cardiac muscle cells. And this will be very important when we learn how electrical impulses travel through the heart. Your heart has the ability to generate its own heartbeat. So if we were to remove your heart from the body and leave it on its own, it would continue beating for a little bit, not, not long, because eventually it would run out of blood supply. Um, but that's something interesting about the heart that we'll talk about. So that's why you need a mechanical pulmonary valve because it wouldn't open and close. It would just stay open all the time. Okay, very interesting. All right, and here is the blood flow through the heart um, that I've talked about several times. Um, I, this slide, I just would use this slide as you're reviewing blood flow through the heart and use one of those pictures maybe the picture showing the internal anatomy of the heart, and I just would review the heart anatomy. And eventually we'll go through this in lab, um, but this gives you something to study tonight and tomorrow. And then this actually is maybe the better picture. I forgot that this was in here. And you can just follow numbers by numbers, and it takes you through blood flow through the heart. The blue boxes or squares or circles are um, deoxygenated blood, and you can go through numbers by numbers, how it goes to the lungs, how it enters back into the left atria via the pulmonary veins, six, seven, and then out the aorta via eight. Um, whenever you see kind of the boxes in yellow, these are the capillaries or the connection between arteries and veins. So when you know your aorta pumps blood to all parts of the body and it eventually divides into many, many arteries, um, those arteries eventually end in capillaries where the exchange of tissues and nutrients occur. And then the other end of the capillary is a vein that then brings the deoxygenated blood back to the heart. So these are all capillaries that you see here um, talking about systemic, coronary, and pulmonary circulation. So use that slide 
as you're kind of reviewing blood throat flow to the heart. And I think we'll stop there. Um, we have about half of the PowerPoint left that we'll get through on Wednesday. Um, if you're just joining us, uh, my email and my Canvas have not been working. So IT is working on fixing that for me. If you do need to get a hold of me, I'm just going to put my email in the chat. And if you're listening to the recording, you can't see the chat. It's just my first initial and my last name, E. Bamer at lbcc.edu. That's my Long Beach City College um, address where I teach as well. So I'll stop the recording and answer any questions.